Thank you. It's good to be back. Thank you for all the birthday wishes on Facebook for uh, my beautiful new suit and the money. I like money. So I got a card with money in it, too. So, wow, what a, what a blessing it is to be here. Y'all look absolutely wonderful. I have missed you so much, and it's so uh, good to be back home with my LifeGate family. I was um, talking to Pastor Mickey on the way here about something I felt like the Lord has been speaking to us concerning, you know, how when you do your web pages and you come up with slogans and sayings and all these things that you want to be and you repeat them to your congregation, such as LifeGate's a church, we want to love out loud, right? So we're constantly thinking of ways to perfect ourselves so that we can show each other that we're loving out loud. And I know that in the body of Christ, we get busy, you know, with our own stuff. And it's hard to get past our stuff to love out loud to someone else, right? So uh, I know that I just want to always keep that at the forefront of who we are. But, but we came up with something else that I feel like is really uh, more of the heartbeat of what LifeGate is. Not just what we want to do, but who we are. So I think you're going to, I believe we're going to be uh, able to even put this more on the, the web page. We're going to, I think, some changes. I just feel like it's stirring inside of me a few little changes as to what our focus needs to be. So we came up with this, uh, LifeGate Church, your place to grow and call home. So, you like that? All right. Um, because it's more about loving out loud. Loving out loud comes out of a place of spiritual maturity and growth in God. So, we're going to be seeing uh, development in the body of Christ as far as you growing and maturing in your giftings, but also understanding the Word of God at a greater revelatory level. I felt like God's bringing that forth in this season for us. There's a shift. But also, it needs to be a place that you really call home. Home is family. That's really, you always want to, you always go back to your roots. Family's always roots, right? So, we, I just wanted to say that, kind of see, I like some of your faces. I saw you smile on that. So, that looks like it's a get-go from there. Um, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It's awesome. The worship team was right on target this morning. The anointing of God is here, and I just want to say we really are in a continued breakthrough season. I want to talk to you this morning about using your secret language. Using your secret language. And I want to start, this is an interesting passage to start with, Revelation 16, verse 15, all the way to the end of the Bible. We're going to go there, Revelations, and this is what it says. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Now, we know that this refers to the end times, but I don't just limit one passage in the Bible to a, always a particular time and season. We know that that refers when Jesus is going to come. I want to go to part B in this passage because this, this relates to us now. Blessed, happy to be envied is he who stays awake. I, I guess I'm reading from a dip, that's from King James. I'm reading from NIV. So just listen to what I have to say. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed, happy to be envied is he who stays awake and alert and who guards his clothes. Guards his clothes so that he, our garments that he may not be naked and have the sh or be ashamed. Or any, anyone see his shame or is exposed. So that's a kind of unusual passage. And when I saw this, it related so much just to where I want to go today. And basically it says, everybody, every one of us needs to stay awake and alert to be sure we got our clothes on. We need to have our clothes on. <laughs> and uh, like I said, it's kind of unusual, but none of us want to be caught naked. And I realized when I was studying this message that so many times I have had dreams where I was actually not clothed well, or I would get to a service or get to a conference, and I'd come in my pajamas, and I wouldn't have my clothes there and, or the clothes that I wanted to wear. And so there was always these, this thing that was showing up in my dreams about being naked, sort of, and, or not having my clothes ready. 
And the Spirit of the Lord, I mean, I began to press into that because I do in my past have a root of shame that I had to be delivered from. But then it was like the Lord bumped me up to another level about my, my responsibility to always put on the full armor of God. And when we don't have our armor on, we are not clothed properly to do battle in the spirit. Or actually, we're not clothed to stand our ground. So with that in mind, I want to look at Ephesians 6. And we're going to look at the full armor of God again. Now, I know this is not new to so many of you understanding the armor of God. But I want to take you to a place today of revelation that maybe you have not seen because this is a place we're going to launch from, I believe, in our new season with God. So it says, and once again, I'm, I'm reading from the NIV version. So I don't know what version they're putting up there. Uh, let me just see what they're putting. All right. Um, there's the NIV for the last passage. So let's see if we can put up the next one for the next passage. Okay, that's ahead of time. Let me just read to you. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. All right. Did anybody bring your Bibles with you this morning? Oh, there it is up there. Okay. What we need to start doing is bringing something to read in case this doesn't happen. In case we don't have it on overhead, bring something that you can get the word out of. Because we can't always depend upon electronics. Amen. So I want you, I'm saying this because I need you to stay with me. This, this is an intense message. All right. Are we, are we all on the same page now? Now it's up there. So uh, let's move to verse 13. Do we have verse 13? All right, there we go. All right. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand ground. See, we just think about, oh, we just need the full armor of God on, but we forget why we need this. We are maturing in God. When you mature in God, that means you've got more revelation. That means you've touched heaven. When you touch heaven, you are gaining ground. Every time the Lord speaks to your heart and reveals something to you, that's new ground to you. But we're not going to be able to stand in it unless we're clothed properly. So we need the, in fact, don't ever take it off. But if you realize you've taken it off and the enemy's coming in, Put it back on. Be awake and alert that the enemy is trying to gain, gain ground and put on your armor. All right. After, and after you have done everything to stand. So what's that saying? When you've done everything you know to do, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I get emails or Facebooks or somebody calls me. Or come to church, somebody, I've done everything I know to do. I've done everything. I have prayed. I have, nah, 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 I've got prayer. Nah, nah. Well, do you have your armor on? We forget. I forget to remind people. Do you have your armor on? Put your armor on. You know, do you have these things in here? Look at this. If you're trying to stand, you need to have your armor on. But then it says, verse 14, stand firm then. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Do you know what that, that actually is symbolic? The belt of truth is like a belt that held up their garments. The belt of truth, truth held up their pants. Now, how many of us would get outside and your pants dropped and you'd forget about putting on truth? So we get outside of the things of God. We get exposed and then we forget, oh, my gosh. I need the truth of God in this situation. I need to begin to speak what God has said. That's what's true about this situation. So if, you know, if, if we got caught in a situation like that, we would definitely put that belt on so that we wouldn't be exposed. The breastplate of righteousness in place. That means constantly reminding ourselves and renewing our mind to the fact that we are righteous that can never be taken away from us. No matter what we've done, 
in the past, no matter what we're going to do, if we have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are righteous. And that gives us a place of a firm foundation in defeating the enemy. Just righteousness alone defeats the enemy. All right. With your feet girded with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Well, if you're going through life and you can't seem to get peace, do you have your shoes on? Because if you're walking around stepping your toe all the time and you don't have peace, if you're not walking in peace, then you need to go and get with God and be sure you're clothed properly. Put on those, put on those garments. And then it says, in addition to all of this, Take up the shield of faith which, so you can extinguish all those flaming arrows that are coming against you with the word of God, which that is the word of God. And then it goes on uh, to say, take the helmet of salvation, which means you take the helmet of sozo. Salvation means sozo in Greek. Sozo is healing, protection, prosperity, deliverance. And I like to add everything that heaven has to offer. You put that on your head, which it covers your thoughts and your mind. So every time the enemy's bombarding you with evil thoughts, remind him of what happened when you received Jesus and you were saved or you were sozoed. You just remind the enemy of that. Put it on as part of your weapon. And then look at this. Verse 18, this is what I want to focus on today. And then it goes on. It doesn't stop there. And it says, and, it's, it's not up there, but, but just hear me. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always praying for all the Lord's people. So we are to pray in the Spirit, and basically that's telling us that when we do that, there's all kinds of prayers and requests. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go further into this, the power of praying in the Spirit. But you are offering up all kinds of prayers and requests. When you pray in the Spirit, you don't know what you're saying because you're praying in the spiritual language. And it says, and you're always praying for the saints too. So this is an, this is an important weapon of warfare. When we, we, when we need to pray for each other, pray in the Spirit. Sometimes you may have something in your, uh, you may see somebody and you know they're troubled and you, and you know there's something going on. Well, that's not the time to go call somebody and tell them what you think they might have done or why they're struggling or add your own two cents in there. That's the time where you pray in the Spirit because you're praying things about them that God wants you to say and pray into existence that has nothing to do what we think or what we assume or what our judgment is saying. This is a weapon of warfare, not just for us, but for the body of Christ as well. And God's saying, I want you to be alert to this. I want you to be awake and on guard that you keep these clothes on. And so many times we have not seen this as part of our armor. We kind of stop with all these other weapons of warfare. We stop with the, all these, this other armor. But very few times do we read the very next verse that is attached with a and do this. And I, I'm convicted by this. I got convicted by this. And usually when I get convicted by it, that means as, as a prophet, it's something I need to share with the body of Christ. Because this will bring us such victory. This, this will ensure us a victory. So I want, I want to just launch, that's our, that's our foundation. I want to talk to you about David. In 2 Samuel 5, verse 17, starts off with the Philistines heard that uh, David had been anointed king over Israel. And so what they did, it says they went up full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now I just want to stop there because... When, you, when the enemy realizes that you are moving forth in your anointing, he's going to come after you. 
if you're under an assignment, let me tell you, it's, it's not because you've done something wrong. So many times, well, what did I do? Did I open a door? Where did the open door come from? Or why is the church under attack? Why is this person sick? Why are people out sick? Why, why are people, you know, it's because we're anointed. It's not because we're doing something wrong. It's because we've been set into a position of authority, and God wants to use it, and he's got a plan and a purpose. Why do we always go to what's wrong? Maybe we need to start looking at what's right. David was doing something right. He had pressed past all the opposition of Saul when he could have ran in the opposite direction. He chose to still stand firm. And now he's at the place of being anointed as king over Israel. And now he's reached his place of firm destiny being revealed. Not just in a cave, not in a small dwelling, not just a king over a, a small group. Now he is anointed over all of Israel, and the Philistines are now angry. And it says, when David hears the enemy is coming against him, he went down to the stronghold. Now, this, this tells me two things. The Philistines were a stronghold. And that means that if for us today, it could be anything that has a stronghold on us. It is a fortress against us that the enemy sets up. But David, when he went to the stronghold, he, meant he went to the place where the stronghold was. But in his heart, the stronghold was always God. The stronghold is not always negative. Um, and it does, I don't have this on the overhead but Psalms 9, 9 reminds us of this. It says, the Lord will be a refuge and a high tower for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. So when the stronghold of the enemy rises up against us, our first immediate reaction would be to run to God. He is our fortress. He alone is our deliverer. He gives us weapons of warfare, but ultimately in every battle, the Lord is our victor. We, we do our part, but he is always our stronghold, and he is always our fortress. And when, when this is stated in the Bible, the Lord is my light and my salvation, Psalm 27, 11. Whom shall I fear? Or who shall I dread? The Lord is the refuge and stronghold of my life. Why am I afraid? Why should we be afraid? You see, and this is saying, basically, I will fight for you. No matter what you're up against, he fights for us. He fights for us. So let's move on back to um, 2 Samuel, verse 18. Now, the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephraim. Now, the valley of Rephraim was uh, the Valley of the Giants. That's what that means, the Valley of the Giants. So David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? So, you know, it's really good when the enemy comes against us that we ask him what we're supposed to do. What's the battle plan? Rather than using the last battle plan, we always need a fresh battle plan for every battle. Now, there are certain things that we definitely need to do, such as put on the armor, pray in the spirit, those kinds of things. But there's always something very specific that God gives us. And in this situation, God answers him and says, go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So he tells David, go and attack them because I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to turn them over to you. So, and we, I just want to pause here and, and remind you that um, the Philistines were a very strong, unclean, it actually means um, wallowing in the dirt. That's what Philistine means. So, it's an unclean spirit. But it's also a, for us today, it represents a very strong religious spirit. It, it represents legalism. And a strong works mentality to make us feel like we have to do this ourselves in our own strength. So can you imagine the times that David, when he was in, in the battle, how he must have himself 
fought against this. I can do this. I can do this. And, you know, we forget to call upon the name of the Lord like it's really up to us. So this was part of the stronghold that he was required to overthrow by the Lord. You know, nothing gets past God. He knows every enemy that comes our way. He always knows ahead of time, but yet we still fight battles, don't we? So in this battle, the first, this first battle we're talking about, the Philistines were given over to him. It says, so David went to Belparisium, and there he defeated them. He said, as the waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So they called that place Belparisium, which means the Lord of Breakthrough which we know that we passed into uh, last month, I guess July, we, we passed into that fresh season of breakthrough, right? We received it by faith. Some of us got it immediately. Some of, some of us are still waiting on it. Some of us got a breakthrough, and now the enemy's back again. And it even says that the Philistines abandoned their idols, and David carried his men off. But I want you to look at verse 22. Once more, the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of the giants, the valley of Rephraim. And David inquired of the Lord, and he asked, and, he, and God answered, Don't go straight up, but circle around behind them and tack them in front of the balsam trees. As soon as you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly, because that will mean... The Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. And it says, David did as the Lord commanded, and they struck down the Philistines. All right, so let me back up. Let me back up a little bit um, and try to get this out the way the Lord gave it to me. A lot is in this passage, so let me try to unpack this. Many of us have been in a similar situation. You got a breakthrough. The enemy came. The Lord gave you a strategy. You defeated the enemy. Maybe it was an unclean spirit. Maybe, and that's also attached to a spirit of shame, which is attached to failure, which, which is also attached to your past. But after you defeat it and you get the victory, just like David, the same enemy comes a second time. This does not mean you didn't get the breakthrough. See, so you think, oh, I just didn't get a breakthrough. What? I must not have done it right. It must. I'm, no, God gave you that breakthrough. But just because the enemy comes again in the same way, with the same clothes on, the same armor, and even some of the same people that you thought had repented and weren't going to do that to you again or say those things, you really thought you had a restored relationship, but it still comes back up. And they're still talking ugly about you. And now they're back. And now you're saying, well, no, you had the victory. It's just that this time it, you need a new strategy. So quit allowing the spirit of shame to try to convince you that you did it wrong the first time. The enemy is relentless. Now, this is King David. <laughs> He, and let me tell you, let me remind you, he knew how to fight a Philistine. If you remember when he was tending the sheep and nobody thought he was anything, even his own father didn't think he could be anointed to do anything other than take care of a flock of sheep. And he was passed by by everybody. Nobody believed in David. He was just tossed to the side. And when the prophet comes to town to anoint the family, it's like, oh, David, you know, you're nothing. Just go. I mean, can you imagine how he felt? Doesn't say a whole lot uh, about that. You got to read between the lines. But here, I mean, but he learned how to fight the enemy because he learned to do what he set his hands to do. Because he, he, he protected those sheep with what was in his hand, which I've been teaching about here lately. Use what you got to defeat the enemy. Don't wait. Don't wait until you think God's going to give you another gift or another opportunity. Let God use you now with what you got. So when, when he goes and he sees Goliath threatening the entire army of Israel, and actually Goliath was threatening David's God. 
And here Goliath, I mean, um, Saul tries to clothe him with his armor. And David, you know, he realizes, I can't fight with this. I'm not used to this. This is not my weapon. We, you need to know what you're anointed with, not what somebody else wants to put on you. Now, what someone, it doesn't have to be a person of authority. I'm talking about other people. Try to pull you into a situation that you're not anointed to deal with. So he goes to fight Goliath, and Goliath makes fun of him. And David says, you come to me with a spear or a javelin, but I, I come to you in the name of the Lord. So David knew. He had the name of the Lord, and he had what was in his hand, which was a slingshot, and he picked five stones, but it only took one. But he defeated that Philistine. So here he is in another situation. He's up against the Philistines again. So he knew how to defeat the spirit. I don't believe he was afraid. I believe he went with faith. But let me just say something also about an unclean spirit, and we have it on the overhead, but I'm not going to go there because of time. In Mark chapter 5 is this story of the, the man that was full of demons. You remember the story of Legion? It says when Jesus and the disciples got out of the boat, it was in an area, the Gadarenes, it's, it's got several different names in the Bible, but... It was in the region of the Gadarenes, and it actually means reward at the end. Reward at the end. And I thought about this because it talks about a man that had an unclean spirit, actually, in this passage. He was full of demons. And it actually says that he, he comes out, and he's... Uh, at Mark chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Out of the tombs, because this man lived among the tombs, this man with an unclean spirit came out. Nothing could, nothing could hinder his, I mean, he, they, would, they would wrap him in chains and tie him up, and he would break out of everything. He was, he was crazy. He was full of demons. But it says he had an unclean spirit. And, you know, that talks to me about a spirit of bondage, but it ta also talks about this unclean Philistine spirit that tries to keep us living in the tombs. And that, that's a place where there's tombstones. And tombstones are set up to be memorials to what is already dead. So it's like you go to a graveyard, it's got somebody's name written across there. It's a tombstone. But it's a constant memory of what should be buried and left behind. This is like present revelation. I'm not talking disrespectful to people that have died that we love. I'm just talking about even people that have died, if it still is an unhealthy memory. We can't keep dragging it back up and let it continue to be a memorial stone in our life that keeps us living among the tombs. It's time to defeat the Philistine spirit in our lives. And this may be, we may have had it defeated before, but I felt by the spirit of the Lord that there is something the enemy keeps trying to put back in front of us that is a memorial of our failure. It is a memorial that brings fear back into our lives. We are afraid of fighting the enemy. Some of us are afraid of the enemy himself, but the enemy is no match for what Jesus did at the cross. So this is a day to take the spoils, not just win the war, but to take the spoils of war, which means you're at a place of increase. But you're not going to get to the place of increase until you fully cross over. And God spoke during worship and said, I've already given you the rod of authority to defeat your enemy. Well, what's the full rod of authority? It's your armor. It's your armor. And that could, because that includes the word of God, to speak the word of the Lord. But this man from Gadarenes, he came out of the tomb. He, he, he went to Jesus, 
And he said, what do I have in common with you? He was begging Jesus, don't cast me out. Don't cast me out. And what do I have in common with you? That's what he said. What was happening is this demon knew Jesus was going to cast him out. He's begging Jesus not to because he knows himself Jesus had nothing in common with the unclean spirit. If he did, he couldn't cast it out. This is why we need to go to a new level of in deliverance ministry. We can't cast it. Satan cannot cast out Satan. Whatever's in us, you can't cast it out of somebody else. If you remember what Jesus said when, uh, when he was at the garden and they came to get him, he said, the power of darkness, the prince of darkness, has nothing in common with me. Remember when he said that? Was that when he said it? I think that that's not in my notes. But anyway, I remember when he, I remember he said it. You, the prince of darkness has nothing in common with me, which he was saying, and nobody really got it, no matter what it looks like, the enemy doesn't have an upper hand here. Even though he was going to die on the cross, the enemy still had nothing in common with him. Does the enemy have anything in common with us today? Because this is a time to put it under our feet and leave it at the cross. Leave it at the cross. And so we know the story. Jesus asked the name of this. He said, what is the name of the spirit? And, and the guy says, like Jesus didn't know. But I think it was for us to know. Uh, he said, uh, there are legion, there are many. There are many, many unclean spirits around. You know, spirits, um, spirits don't die. Those, those demonic spirits do not die. They just get cast out and they go find another place to dwell. There's, you know, when we talk about Jezebel's spirit, Jezebel herself, the woman in the Bible, died a long time ago. But the spirit that influenced her life to be such a destructive, demonic force upon the earth, that spirit still roams around. It, it, it's got several others that it's adopted into her family. So there are many unclean spirits. And in fact, that's the number one most commonly mentioned name of a spirit in the Bible is the unclean spirit. And the reason why I say it's attached to religious spirits is because Jesus uh, called the Pharisees unclean. So you see, how I, th I think the religious spirit is such a, it is, it, I, I hate that spirit because it, it opposes the move of God. It opposes revelation. It tries to keep the spirit of God boxed in. Won't let the spirit of prophecy flow or healing and signs. Didn't you enjoy worship? Did, could you not feel the anointing this morning? Well, the unclean spirit opposes, the Pharisee spirit opposes the anointing of God. So I don't think it was by accident that the Philistine spirit continually tried to rise up against David. He brought in a new order of worship. They didn't understand that type of worship that, that was in David. When he was over here taking care of the sheep, that's all he did was worship. But when he became king, remember, he is the one that brought the ark back to Israel. It had been captured, you know, by who? The Philistines. The Philistines captured the ark later on. They had the ark of God held captivity. But David had it brought back in. And when he did that, he, there was worship that was offered 24 hours a day. And yet that was, that was unheard of. You didn't do that. The religious order, oh, no, you can't do that. Well, David, he, he didn't care about the religious system. When he and his men came out of battle and they were hungry, they went to the temple and ate the showbread. They ate the holy food that was meant for the priesthood and dedicated completely to God. And he could have actually 
uh, been slain by the Pharisees for doing that. It was completely not just uh, violating what God had set up, but it violated the law, which means that he could have been destroyed for that. But David knew God to the extent that he knew that God knew where he was and that he was hungry. And he pressed beyond that. What kind of people are we going to be? Because let me tell you, the same spirit's opposing us today. It's opposing us for pressing into what we know who God is, what he says about us, and regardless of what somebody else says or thinks about us or tries to hold us back, we are determined to touch God. Pressing past religious order and rules and regulations, all different denominations. I mean, I can write the very best article that's posted on Elijah list, and I'll have 9,900, 200 likes. Uh, thank you so much. And then there's this one religious spirit that, that emails me, even actually goes on to um, Internet. And, you know, you go and you look at my name. There's a, you know, and I've been called a heretic. And I mean, it's, you, you can just read. And I'll, and, but I'll get all these wonderful reviews. And then this one religious spirit, uh, you know, God can't move like that. God doesn't know anything about prophecy. You know, who do you think you are? And I'll just go days with that in my heart. Like, God, you know, I'm just tired of being persecuted. I'm just tired of being persecuted. I'm just tired. Don't like it. I hate it. I don't want to be a prophet anymore. Take this anointing away from me. I know none of you have done that. But it's the very same spirit you fight with whenever God tells you he wants to use you in a certain area, and here comes that spirit of intimidation. Well, that's what the uh, Goliath did to David, tried to intimidate him, hurled all these at you. You're small. You're, you don't know anything. You're, a, you're not a warrior. Look at you. You don't have an armor. So what does God do? He says, don't go straight up after them this time, but go around. But when you hear this sound in the tops of these trees, then move quickly. So it actually says in the King James that God says, when you hear this sound, be stir yourself. In other words, stir yourself up. Get yourself stirred up. And then wait. You hear this sound, but basically when you're stirring yourself up, you're waiting. You hear the sound. You bestir yourself, and then you go. So there's this kind of like a word in between again. What's going on when you're stirring yourself up? You're hearing the, the sound that actually the sound is supposedly came from the wind. It was like a wind blew, and it carried, you know, when wind blows, it carries sound. Have you noticed that? So this wind was carrying the sound, and the sound came across the top of the balsam trees. Now, many times people refer, use that to refer to the angel armies that may have gone across. And I get that, and I say yes. But I think that there is more to that. I think that there really was a wind that could have blown that was very significant attached to Acts chapter 2, which was when the day of Pentecost. Because, you see, they had to wait. Jesus told, told them, he said, told his disciples he was fixing to go to heaven. He said, I want you to wait for the promise. And so what did they do? They went and they went and they prayed until the, until the day of Pentecost came. They were praying in the upper room. Well, the upper room to me is like the top of the, the trees. It's still in a high place. And so it says in Acts 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house. And then they saw tongue, like what seemed tongues of fire separated them. And it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. So this is like another wind. Now, where am I going with this? Because tongues is our prayer language. It was the power of the Holy Spirit 
being birthed upon the earth. It was the birthing of the church. But it was a weapon of warfare being released to the church. They really didn't even understand what they had. They didn't fully understand it. I want you to fully understand what God has given you. It is a weapon of warfare. It is a sound. It is a wind that defeats the enemy, just as the sound and the wind were all used to empower David to defeat the enemy. So what do we do? We stir ourselves up and expect God to give the victory. Well, how do we stir ourselves up? By praying in the Spirit. Many of you have heard this story before. It was when the United States, United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor, and actually the Japanese held the Pacific Rim. And we tried every which way, the Allies, us, to take the ground back. We tried to rise up and defeat the enemy, but it was, it was as if the Japanese knew, they knew every strategy before we even went to battle. Somehow or another, they were finding out all of our secrets. And we couldn't figure out how the enemy, they couldn't figure out how the enemy knew our every turn, and we would lose these battles. And then they got to thinking, well, this is interesting, the, and because so many of the Japanese spoke English. Now there are enemies, but they attended school in the United States and learned English, and now they're fighting for the Japanese. So somehow or another, they were intercepting our messages. The, the codes, our secret codes that were spoken in English were being intercepted, and they decoded all of our military orders, and they knew our plans ahead of time, and they set up ambushments against us. And this is why we couldn't rise up. But in February around 1943, there was a man named Philip Johnson. And this particular man never was able to fight in the military. He was in his 50s, and he, couldn't, he was too old to go and fight, but he always had it in his heart to be a part. And he, he got to praying, and he got to thinking. And he was a son of a missionary. Uh, and they were missionaries to this tribe of Native Americans called the Navajo Indians. And he got to thinking, and I really believe it was the Spirit of the Lord that gave him this breakthrough idea about what if we could use this Navajo language and teach others to use this language, they wouldn't be able to intercept our codes. And because, see, he knew the Navajos, and he also knew that it had never, not one time, been made into a Navajo alphabet. Nobody could read the language. It wasn't written down. It could only be learned by being in that tribe. So it was all self-contained. No one understood that language but that little group of Navajo tribe just gives you chill bumps when you think about the, the power of this. So he presented this, this idea, let's teach this language to a certain number of people. They will learn the code, and the people they send the code to, that we'll all know, they'll put them in strategic places, put them in, uh, and have them at strategic times in battle, and only the people receiving the code will understand the language. There would be no way the enemy could decode what the plans were. So they gathered a lot of generals together and discussed it and took about, it was around 30 men all together, including the ones that taught the language to others. They gathered these men from the Navajo tribe that spoke their private language. And it actually turned the tide. When the secret codes were released, it turned the tide to the war and the enemy could not break this code. This, these particular men that learned this Navajo tongue, the secret language, were called wind talkers. They were also called cold, code talkers. 
but one of the most common names was wind talkers. Wind talkers. When you hear the sound of the wind. You see, it's a, it, what we have available to us today is a private language. When you pray in the Spirit, we have no idea what we're saying. I have a friend. His name is Sandy Cook, and he is a... Um, he was born a Jew. He's now uh, converted. He's a Messianic Jew. He's a wonderful man. We plan to get him here one day. He's a friend of ours for years. He, his, uh, his girlfriend at the time uh, was trying to convert him to Christianity, and she talked him into going into one of these, of all places, a spirit-filled church. I mean, he said, I maybe could have handled the Catholics because they have their, you know, it's a little bit more structured, I guess I should say. But he said, but she takes me to this place, and, they, and she said, right in the middle of the service, someone comes forth with this message in tongues. And he said, it scared me so bad I ran out the back. And, in the, they had, and he said, I was trying to get out the door, but they had one of the doors was locked. And he said, then I was, I was trying to get out the door that was locked, and then he said, then I realized I could get out the other door, but, but before he could get to the other door, there was an usher that came out to see if he was okay. And, uh, and he said, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I need out of here. And the usher started praying in tongues because the usher didn't know what to do with Sandy. So he starts praying in tongues, and Sandy said, I literally fell to my knees because he started praying in Hebrew. And it was only a specific dialect that a certain group of Hebrews understood. And Sandy was raised in that very specific select. Actually, it was elect select group. And he said, and he born again immediately. He was born again because of a tongue. Where this man that spoke it didn't know what he was saying. He didn't even know it was Hebrew. I got an email from a friend of mine, uh, actually uh, Josh, Tom, Mommen's wife. You, you know her. Is Josh here? Oh, okay. You know Tom. Mom. What, what is her first name? Marsha. Marsha, okay. They sent me an email about being in church, and the man next to them are, uh, is Hispanic, and he doesn't know English at all. But he came, he had, like, earphones in. But during worship, he was just worshiping. And she starts praying in tongues. And so he grabs her and he said, you speak in my language. You speak in my language. <laughs> and he started crying. He wasn't born again. He got born again immediately because she, she's praying in this unknown language and she's speaking. We don't know how God can use the code of our language. We don't know what we're saying, but he knows what we're saying. And he's speaking things back to us in a heavenly language because you know what? If he spoke to us in our own language, we'd probably argue with him. I can't do that. What do you mean you want me to go do that? I can't pray for her. I'm mad at her. And yet God's in, you know, Jesus says he intercedes. Well, maybe we're doing it with him and just not realizing we're doing it. Part of our armor, part of our armor. And I want to close with this last story. This is so good. And I'm sure you've heard this story before, too. Two young girls, one, uh, 16, 14, they were just going to go right down the street to get something to eat. And it was a pastor's, one of them was a pastor's daughter. And he was telling the story. While on the way to get something to eat, the car broke down, and they pulled off to the side of the road. And immediately, this man pulls up beside them, walks up to the car, and actually kidnapped them, put one girl in the front seat, and the pastor's daughter was in the back seat. So he's, they have no idea. They're crying. They're, they're terrified. Um, they're held captive. And the young girl looks down the floorboard, and she sees a rope and tape and a knife. 
And she said her mind just went everywhere, like, oh, my gosh. You know, our minds now could go every which way imagining what this man actually had planned. No telling. And we would think the worst things. Just like this young girl, this 14-year-old girl, is terrified imagining what kind of plans this enemy had for her. So what did she do? She starts praying in tongues. And she's not quiet about it. She is praying in tongues under her breath, and then she gets louder. And then you know how it goes. You may start off with just a little whisper, but sometimes there's times it comes out as a shout. And you don't know what Holy Spirit is doing. But you just know that sometimes that's all you know to do. When you're up against the enemy and he's got plans to destroy you, when he's coming against your kids, when he's coming against your business, when he's trying to destroy your reputation, when he's trying to destroy your ministry, we don't know sometimes how to pray because we'll blame others. We'll be mad about something. You, there's times you, you can't take angry into prayer. In fact, we don't need to take angry into prayer unless it's against ang- I mean, unless it's anger against the enemy. And so she just kept praying. And she noticed the man was getting irritated. He'd just keep, hey, quit that. Stop that. And then she'd just keep praying in tongues. He said, Stop that. I'm telling you, stop that. He got so irritated. He stopped the car and says, Get out of this car. I don't want anything to do with either one of you. And their lives were saved. He drove off, and they're fine today. They're fine. But you see the example. When we're up against a stronghold, and we don't know how to fight, because, you know, David inquired, then we can inquire in our prayer language. And we may not even understand it all, but see, the whole thing is God's the one that fights the battle for us. He's the one that wins the war. I want you to, I want you to leave today clothed. So I want every one of you to stand. And we're just going to spend just a few. I want to get you stirred up today. I want you to leave stirred up. We don't have any idea what awaits us on the other side of these church doors. We come here, we're all excited, and we can dance and we can shout, do a Holy Ghost, swinging from the chandelier time. But there's an enemy that's got plans. So we're, why, we, we just need to, we need to pray in tongues just a few moments. I mean, I don't know how long it's been since some of you prayed in tongues. But this needs, if if we're going to put on the full armor of of God every day, we need to pray in tongues every day. Uh, You know, Bishop Hammond wrote a book, is it 70 reasons? 76 reasons to pray in tongues. What I've just given you is only one. Reading that book would be very beneficial. Some of you are at war over your kids. Some of you are in warfare over different members of your family. Some of you need a financial breakthrough, and you have asked God over and over and over, what do I need to do? This is a day to break through in your spirit realm. Now, some of, some people here may not be, have received the prayer language. If you have not received that prayer language, Pastor Mickey, he, why don't you come up? Come up here and stand with me. If if you if you want to receive the prayer language, will we see someone here after the service that can lead you into receiving that? We don't want you to leave without it if you don't have it. But if you don't have it now, as we pray in tongues, just lift up a prayer to the Lord. That's still praying in the spirit. Because you're letting God, if you just pray and ask God, how do I pray? He'll show you what to pray right now. 
I believe that. But for those of us that have had the privilege of receiving that very special gift, you want to pray today? You want to pray today in the Spirit? Joshua, do we have some music for that? Are you ready? I'm just going to pray, and then I want you just to break out and just pray in tongues. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for an upper room experience today. Lord, you've given us part of a weapon. You've, I mean, you've given us part of an armor, a weapon of warfare against our enemy. Lord, we're, we're going to stir ourselves up today. Lord, we are believing for breakthrough. We've maybe defeated this enemy once, but he's come again. We're going to defeat the enemy. We're allowing you to use us to pray in the name of Jesus. All right, come on, church. Come on, stir yourself up. Get yourself stirred up against your enemy. Whatever it is that's coming against you, the Spirit of the Lord is going before you. Come on now. Oh. Serving in your sons and daughters. Come on. Stir up. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Facebook Live video. Most Sundays we have altar call, which is personal. And for that reason, we do not air this part of the service. We hope you understand and that you enjoyed the message. If you have any questions or concerns or if you have any revelation from the word today and you'd like to share it, or any testimonies for that matter as well, please reach us as on social media and those links will be following. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.